I'm not a prophet. I don't know what will happen. Nobody knows what will happen because it's not determined yet. It depends on the decisions that we take now and in the coming years. Um, if it was determined, there was no point writing books about it. Um, the, the idea is not to make some prediction and then be very proud that your prediction came true. The idea is to try and map different possibilities that humanity faces in the hope that people will choose, will make the right decisions. And then the most uh, dystopian scenarios will not come true. If my worst predictions will not come true, I will see this as a big success, as, as a reason to be very happy that we managed to avoid this. And this is also one of the reasons that uh, I'm now publishing this new book, the graphic novel, in the hope of reaching a wider audience, uh, people who might not read traditional science books, but they might find interesting to read this graphic novel, which plays along in, in different ways of, of, of conveying scientific findings to the general population. The most important thing is to have a medical and economic safety net for the entire planet. Currently, we are seeing that some countries are doing okay, but other countries are facing a medical catastrophe and also economic collapse. And the poorer countries will not be able to get through this crisis by themselves. So we need a, a global cooperation. First of all, in the uh, development of treatments and vaccines, the production and distribution of medical equipment, instead of having countries compete against each other for scarce resources, we need some mechanism to distribute it more equally. And I'm really horrified by what we are seeing today that some countries are actually entering a kind of uh, vaccine arms race that they refuse to share reliable data with other countries. They even spy on other countries in the hope to be the first ones to develop a vaccine and then have a monopoly over it and either make a lot of money out of it or use it for political leverage. This is extremely dangerous and counterproductive. We need a global effort here. The most important thing is, is data, is information. So, and for that, we need countries to trust the information they receive from other countries. The other thing we need is really an economic plan that will uh, save the weakest members of humankind, but we aren't seeing it. Uh, you know, the stock, the stock markets are going up like crazy. The big tech companies are making billions and billions. It's like the best time ever for them. Everything is moving online. Everything is digitalized. So the value of corporations like Apple, like Amazon, has really you know, gone up dramatically. And just this week, we got uh, this report that the billionaires and the top 1% of, the, of, the, of humanity is actually became fabulously richer because of this pandemic. And we need to share these resources, this wealth, with the billions who are left behind and who are suffering the worst consequences. Of, of this epidemic. I don't see it happening so far, but uh, I hope we will be moving in that direction. You know, just to give another example, you have the US president, who is the president and is a billionaire, allegedly, 
and he paid a total of $750 in taxes, in federal taxes, in a year when he was president. That's absolutely crazy. I mean, who, if he doesn't pay taxes, who is supposed to uh, finance healthcare systems for any, you know, forget about the rest of the world. Forget about Peru and Brazil and India, you know, even in the United States, the richest country in the world, there are millions and millions of people without good health care. And if the billionaire president finds ways not to pay taxes, so what hope do we have? Um, you know, the definition is not so important. The important thing is to understand the reality. What is actually happening? And the shift in power from humans to algorithms is already underway. It's not a prediction for the future. It's what's happening right now. In many places, when you apply today for a job, your application is not being screened by a human being. It's being screened by an algorithm. If you apply to a bank to get a loan, the decision whether to give you a loan is taken not by a human banker, but by a computer algorithm, which goes over enormous amounts of data about you in order to decide your fate. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's now so sophisticated that nobody understands anymore how the algorithm actually makes a decision. If the bank rejects your loan application and you ask the bank, why not? Why did you not give me a loan? The bank says, we don't know. We have this algorithm that makes all the decisions and we Isn't just believe the algorithm. Scary. It is very scary. Now in Europe, the European Union, as part of the new data regulation, is also kind of guaranteeing or try to guarantee the right for an explanation. If an algorithm made a decision about your life, not to accept you to university, to reject your application for a job, to reject your application for a loan, you have a right to receive an explanation. But this is not really going to solve the problem because the key thing is that algorithms make decisions in a different way than humans, in a way that humans can't understand. If a court forces the bank to give me an explanation, then the bank can just print one million pages of all the data the algorithm calculated, processed, and just give it to me. Here, that's the explanation. The algorithm went over these trillion bits of data that it collected on you from your Facebook account, from your Instagram account, from facial recognition cameras, everything. That's all the data. And based on that, it rejected your application. Here you can read it. Now, what can you do with it? It's, I mean, we are facing really a historical transition because we are now facing a kind of if you like, some people call it an alien invasion. Imagine that I will tell you that there is right now a fleet of alien spaceships coming from planet Zircon. In 2050, these aliens will reach Earth and take over. How would you react? Now, we are in this situation. There is a fleet of alien intelligence coming to take over the Earth, but it's not coming from planet Zircon, it's coming from Silicon Valley. It's coming from the headquarters of all the big tech companies. And you know, it's not like a science fiction scenarios that the robots will rebel and start shooting people in the street. No, they are taken over, they are taking over through the banks, through the corporations, through the government organizations, more and more decisions are being taken by the algorithms. They are not evil. They have no consciousness. 
They have no plan to take over the world, but they are an alien intelligence. They make decisions in a way that we can't understand. So in 20 or 30 years, most of the decisions about your life will be taken by something you can't understand. You know, even in the political realm, something like the financial system is going to become so complicated that nobody would be able to understand it. You know, even today, how many people really understand the financial system, how it works? Less than 1%, I think, is a fair estimate. In 30 years, the number of people who understand how the financial system works will be exactly zero. Yes. Nobody. It will be, you know, so much data being processed so quickly that even if you have a human prime minister, the human prime minister would be helpless. You know, you get, if you're the human prime minister, you get a phone call maybe from the algorithm in the finance department, and the algorithm tells you, look, prime minister, we are facing a financial crisis, but I can't explain to you how I reached this conclusion because you have a human brain. You know, I crunched trillions of data bytes to reach the conclusion I can't, I can't explain to you, you're a human. And also, you, we have two options, how to deal with this financial crisis. And you have to choose. But I can't explain to you what these choices are. It's too complicated. You won't understand. You know, it's like trying to explain Wall Street to a Neanderthal. This will be the situation. And again, it's not robots running around killing people. It's not this science fiction scenario. It's a gradual process which is already happening all around us. And, you know, COVID is just accelerating it. There are many things to be done. I'll give just one or two points because I don't want to take all day. <laughs> one thing is that data should not be monopolized by a small number of corporations or by uh, uh, the government. Because those who control the data in the 21st century control the world. We are close to the point when you can follow all the people all the time. And if you have enough data and enough computing power, you can hack human beings. Yes. You can understand people better than they understand themselves. You can know their personality, their sexual preferences, their medical condition better than they know, and then you completely control and manipulate them. You know, in the past, to control a country, you needed soldiers and tanks and kind of some kind of military dictatorship. Now, we just need the data. Imagine, say, Portugal in 20 years, when somebody in San Francisco or Beijing or Moscow has all the personal data of every politician, every judge, every journalist, every police officer in Same Portugal. Thing. In such a situation, Portugal has become a data colony. You don't need to send any military units into the country in order to control it. You just need to take the data out. So we need to regulate the flow of data to prevent the concentration of too much data in too few places. Another thing is, yes, more and more data is being collected on individuals, on citizens, to balance it we need to monitor the big corporations and government the same way they monitor us. At present, it's mainly one way. Facebook knows many things about me. I don't know much about it. The government knows many things about me. I know far less about what's going on there. You know, with all the talk about the loss of privacy, Trump managed to keep secret for several years his tax records. So this is still private. 
you know, everything, everything is being monitored, but somehow the tax records of the president, this is private, this is not shared. So we need to balance it. Every time we increase monitoring of the individual citizens, we need to increase monitoring of the big corporations and the government. You know, so many engineers are developing applications to monitor me. Why shouldn't they develop an application to fight corruption in the government? Let's say we develop an application that you take out your smartphone, you click, you, you, you code, you, you, you write the name of a politician, of some minister or whatever, and within half a second, you see all the relatives and friends that this politician appointed in his or her department or whatever. Very easy. Why don't we have this kind of application? So we need to balance it. That's the way to keep a democratic system in this age of uh, technological revolution. They are extremely efficient in uh, stopping the, the epidemic, but they can be extremely dangerous because they can then be the basis for a large-scale surveillance regime that we have never seen before in history, not even in totalitarian regimes like the Soviet Union or like Nazi Germany. Dictators throughout history dreamt about having this kind of power to follow everybody all the time, but they didn't have the technology. Now we have the technology, and there is a danger that in this time of pandemic, such surveillance systems will be legitimized, yeah. and then they will become part of our ordinary life when Big Brother is really watching you all the time, and not only watching you, but can also go under your skin. I understand. Previously, if you live in the Soviet Union, or even in Portugal in the time of Salazar and the dictatorship, so maybe there is some secret police agent following you around. You don't know, but somebody is watching you. They see who you meet, uh, where you go, uh, what books you buy and read, and but they, they don't really know what's happening inside your, your head. Now, we, have, we are developing, and COVID is important in this respect, we are developing biometric surveillance tools that enable an outside system not just to see what's happening above your skin, where you go, who you meet, but what's happening under your skin. What's your body temperature? Your, what's your blood pressure? Which parts of your brain are now active? It's still in its infancy, but it's developing very rapidly. And again, this is a kind of potentially totalitarian tool that never existed before in history. Even George Orwell didn't imagine the possibility that Big Brother could actually monitor your biological processes all the time. You know, emotions are biological phenomena, just like diseases. The same tool that knows that you now have a fever can also know that you are now angry or bored or sexually excited. So imagine what kind of control a dictatorial government can have when it can follow the emotions of every single individual 24 hours a day. I think there is a tendency today in the world to understand humans increasingly in physical and biological terms. That's just what is happening around us. It's not a question of your religious or philosophical belief. It's a question of the technology. Corporations and governments now have the tools to predict and manipulate your choices like never before in history. 
And the easiest people to manipulate are the people who believe that they can't be manipulated. The people who think that everything they, they choose is the outcome of their free will. Because if you think your choices are completely free, there is no room for curiosity. You know, why did I vote for this party? Why did I buy this product? Because this is my free will. There is no question. Once you move aside this naive belief and you start investigating, you realize that our decisions are to a large extent shaped by biological processes inside the body and increasingly by external manipulation. And I think we all need to acknowledge whatever our religious and philosophical beliefs, we need to acknowledge that in the 21st century, it is becoming easier than ever to manipulate our choices and opinions. Freedom is something, is not something you have. Freedom is something you need to struggle for. If you just assume automatically that you are a free agent and everything you decide to do is free, then you are the easiest person to control. Because you don't even suspect all the kind of manipulations that are being done on you. If you realize that you now live in such a world, then you can try and struggle for your freedom. But you cannot take it for granted. Um, yes, I mean, throughout history, humans created many different kinds of religions. You know, in the, in the graphic novel, we have, uh, 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 we created to, to, to explain this idea that really the source of human power is this ability to create religions and mythologies and fictional stories because they are the basis for large-scale cooperation. To get a lot of people to cooperate together on a project, uh, you need them to believe the same story. So, in, in the book, we created this fictional character, Dr. Fiction, who is a superhero, she is a superhero, and she personifies the human ability to create fictions, spread them around, and thereby uh, have large-scale cooperation. And throughout history, this super, human superpower has been the basis again and again for all civilizations and, and societies. Particular religions like Christianity or Islam or Hinduism, they rise, they spread and change and sometimes disappear. You know, humans like us that can create religions have been around for something like 70,000 years. All these religions are very, very new. None of the big religions of today existed 5,000 years ago, or even 3,000 years ago. That's a very short time in human history. Now, they are quite good at adapting themselves. This is why they did manage to survive for, say, 2,000 years or so. But what will happen in the next century uh, is a big question. Some religions might disappear. Some religions could adapt to the new technological and economic conditions. And new religions are likely to be created. But the key thing to understand is that religions are not created in heaven and come down to earth in some kind of eternal form. They are created by human beings and they continuously change. Christianity today is a very different religion than Christianity a thousand years ago. And that's true of Hinduism and Islam and all other religions too. 
Um, I still don't have a smartphone. I still at least try to meditate two hours a day. I succeed almost every day in doing it, but uh, you know, let's see what happens next. Um, I'm, I, I describe myself as vegan-ish more than vegan. I try not to be religious about it. Um, I try to limit my involvement as far as possible in the uh, industrial exploitation of animals, but it's impossible to completely disentangle myself from it because, you know, you live in the world and there are so many causal connections between everything you do and everything that happens in the world that it's impossible. Uh, uh, I think that the purest fantasy that I can be completely cut off from these kinds of things, this is, this is unrealistic, but I do my best. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I still try to maintain this kind of, of, uh, of life. Um, it would have been very difficult for me to write any of my books without the discipline and focus that meditation gives me and um, without the peace and quiet that I gain from not having a smartphone. No, many things have changed. Uh, our life, um, my husband and me, I mean, our life has changed quite dramatically since the success uh, of, of these books. They are really a collaborative effort. I, I may be the writer, the author, but you know, to have a successful book, you need an entire team of people. And much of the success I, uh, really goes to my husband, who is the uh, organizational genius behind assembling this team of people and negotiating everything and uh, it wouldn't have happened without him. And over the last few years, our life really changed. We travel around the world to all these conferences and meetings and lectures. We've established uh, a social impact company called Sapienship, which tries to focus the global conversation on the most important challenges to humankind. That, that's the aim. You know, humans are now flooded by enormous amounts of information. They don't know what to pay attention to. So our number one mission is to help people focus on the big picture. And this is why we make this effort to uh, like, the, the, again, the, the new book, the graphic novel. So the idea is, let's try and reach a wider audience. People who might not read a science book like Sapiens, but might be interested in a graphic novel. So for me, it was, it was fun to really kind of break all the academic conventions. I'm a professor at university. I've been writing books and articles for like, I don't know, 30 years now, uh, almost. And, you know, to just leave aside all the conventions of how you write science and let's go wild, let's experiment. One, you know, one chapter is like a, a superhero movie action. One chapter is like a detective movie. One chapter is reality TV, like we tell the story of human evolution as a reality TV show in competition between different species. So it really changed my life, not just in the sense that, okay, we now travel to different places around the world, but also as an intellectual, as a, an, as a historian, I have the freedom to experiment with so many different things. And, you know, like 10 years ago, I would never dream that one day I would be writing a comic book. No, not by myself. Again, there is an entire team. We work especially with two very gifted artists, Daniel and David, about the storyline and, and the drawings. I don't know how to draw. I draw like a five-year-old kid. So it is a collaborative effort. And um, it completely changed my life as an 
academic, as a historian, to do these things. I've just finished a really wonderful book uh, called The Last Whalers. It's uh, an anthropology book, you can say, about a community of whalers, traditional community of a tribe of whalers on an island in Indonesia over the last 30 years and how they deal with the challenges of globalization and the tourism, industrialization. Now, in 1990, they were still living like their ancestors, um, rowing wooden boats to hunt whales with harpoons. And within 30 years, they suddenly had to deal with, you know, everything from Instagram and Facebook to tourists flooding their island and huge ocean, ocean-going fleets of trawlers and fishers uh, and fisheries coming from China and th- South Korea to hunt in their waters. And it's really a fascinating story how different members of this community try to deal with this invasion invasion of the modern world. So the, the, it's a very powerful and, and a really very well written account of, of this of this story. What else? Mm. I've recently read Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff from mm-hmm. Harvard University. Uh, which is a very, it's a dense book. It's not an easy book in terms of reading, Mm -hmm. but it's extremely interesting in the way she analyzes what the technological revolution is doing to our economic and social and political system, and especially the immense power of surveillance technology. Many of my ideas, like what we talked about earlier, actually comes from her research and the research of of other scholars like her. And one other book that I can mention is um, by Christiana Figueres. She is the architect of the Paris Agreement from 2015. Uh, But it's it's a it's a short book focused on what how we can deal with the ecological crisis and especially with climate change and it's a very hopeful and inspiring book maybe the most inspiring book i've read in a long time uh really details what we as humanity and also individual people can do in order to uh overcome this immense challenge of climate change and in the ecological collapse. Well, I, I, I don't really believe in the possibility of perfection, <laughs> but I can describe for you an ordinary day, okay. like what an ordinary day looks for me. So I usually wake up around 6.30, 7, 7.30 in the morning. I almost never wake up with an alarm clock. I mean, I, you know, I wake up when I wake up, but it's usually around this hour. I would then sit for one hour of meditation and then eat breakfast, which is almost always the same breakfast uh, of uh, oat porridge, <laughs> maybe with some fruits. Then I will go to the computer and uh, check my emails and then start working on whatever project is now like uh, the, the main thing. It could be the graphic novel or something else. And then I work until around one o'clock or something, I would eat lunch, take some rest, do another hour of meditation, maybe one or two more hours of work at the computer, and then that's the end of the workday. Um, and then I maybe meet friends, maybe uh, watch some TV show with my husband, um, maybe go for a walk in the, in the nearby countryside, something like that. I, yeah, I cook. I, I make porridge every morning. <laughs> so that's a kind of cooking. And uh, we cook lunch. It's usually some kind of, you know, like could be chickpeas with rice and uh, vegetables or something like that. So we also we cook every day. Uh, yeah. 